Okay, good afternoon. My name is Burton Lim, Assistant Curator of Mammalogy at the Royal Antara Museum. I'm delighted uh, you could join us for today's Curator Conversations, a digital program that explores themes and subjects from ROM collections alongside experts and professionals related to the museum industry. For their ongoing support of this program, a big thank you to TD for making it happen. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. This Curator Conversations event is in conjunction with our upcoming exhibit, uh, Great Whales Up Close and Personal. We would like to acknowledge the support of our Royal Exhibition Circle donors in making this show possible. My guest today is Jacqueline Miller, our mammalogy technician at the ROM, who has been an integral part, uh, an integral member of the Great Whales curatorial team. Uh, Jackie was involved in getting the blue whale and the plastinated heart from Rocky Harbor in Newfoundland to the ROM in 2014. And she led the discovery of the North Atlantic right whale skeleton that will be displayed alongside the blue whale and sperm whale in the upcoming exhibition. Today's presentation is the first in a series of virtual and in-person programs that will showcase the ROM's commitment to research, education, and conservation of Canada's iconic whales, including the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. The exhibition, Great Whales Up Close and Personal, will open this summer. We'll begin with a short intro and then discussion around Jackie's experiences in the field, collecting these magnificent mammals and get behind the scene details into displaying three large whales in the exhibition. During the program, please submit your comments via the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen and we'll have some time at the end to answer your questions. Okay, so welcome Jackie to Curator Conversations. Thank you, Burton. It's really great to be here. Uh, so, uh, much like me, uh, who studies smaller mammals, including bats, your academic interests were studying primates and rodents. So, how did you get involved with whales? Well, that's, that's, that's interesting. So, my background before joining the ROM uh, was in zoology. I studied uh, small mammals, uh, actually with several of the curators here at the ROM. And uh, my big interest was in animal communication, particularly vocal behavior in, uh, I was working on small mice and um, it translated to much larger animals as I grew more experience at the ROM. In fact, working with whales was one of my first, uh, first big exercises I had um, as a ROM technician. So it, that was a really great experience. Also, it's my interest in comparative anatomy. Uh, all things, all forms of mammals interest me, and um, I like to think of it, think of them in terms of how their ecology, how their evolutionary history uh, molds their appearance, molds the, the way they interact with their environments. And uh, so, you know, the ROM is a, a perfect place to be, uh, to be playing with these ideas. Okay, very interesting. I had a, sort of a similar background myself, uh, but Today's uh, talk is about, about uh, right whales in particular. Um, so can you tell us a bit about what happened to uh, North Atlantic right whales in 2017? So a lot of people will remember there was um, a lot of news coverage about a terrible mortality event in the summer of 2017 that initially involved seven North Atlantic right whales which were found dead in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, this was unusual in many ways. One, it was unusual because it progressed through that year and the subsequent following 2018-2019 to a total of, it's estimated, as many or even more than 40 individual whales were lost. Uh, and it's, what's tragic about that is the population of North Atlantic right whales, the entire species, is uh, numbers less than 400. It's thought to be about 365 individual whales. Um, so that summer, uh, this all centered around the July 1st uh, holiday weekend in Canada, and it was unique because these whales normally wouldn't be seen in these numbers in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, at least not up until that time, and their movement 
in Atlantic waters has been shifting for, the, for, over the, for just over the last decade, but in a very radical way, such that they're not, uh, they're not being found in um, foraging grounds and it, with migratory patterns that they normally uh, would, would be associated with. And this has caused a, a great deal of concern for Canadian and international scientists um, that are really keenly interested in trying to protect these animals. So that week, that holiday weekend, it was just a few days before uh, when we, we got involved, we were, the ROM was uh, contacted by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans about these whales and about the fact that there was going to be a very large necropsy of at least three whales on the, um, the on Fee Shore Beach, which is at the northeast side of um, Prince Edward Island. And we were invited, given our interest in trying to build our um, our assets of, um, of whale uh, information and whale remains and skeletons that we could mount to come and see if we could harvest the remains of one of those whales. Um, yeah, so I, I also know that um, Oliver Hadrath, who's a DNA technician uh, at the ROM also, so he was there uh, helping you um, uh, not only recover the skeleton, uh, but also to uh, take tissue samples uh, for... Uh, yeah, for yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a huge uh, um, focus of importance at the, at the museum and the Department of Natural History. It's not just, you know, the physical skeletal remains of animals and the information about those animals, but the information that's locked into their genome. And uh, we've been being more, uh, more involved in genomic research as the years um, go by and that technology advances. And Oliver Hadrath is our, is our molecular technician in the Department of Natural History that takes on most of these tasks and, and works on the uh, bioinformatics of, of what to do with that information that, that we can uh, uncover from tissue samples from these whales. Uh, and not a lot is known about the North Atlantic right whale. So this was a terrific opportunity to not only get uh, you know, a, a really wonderful uh, skeleton that we could mount for our exhibition, but also to get more important information that can impact our understanding of their, their natural history and perhaps uh, other aspects of their biology. Okay, so, um, so after you guys uh, got on site um, on PEI uh, and you did um, uh, I guess you're salvaging uh, operation. Uh, so how, how long um, were, you, were you guys uh, there uh, on site uh, uh, collecting the skeleton and the tissue samples? So we weren't there that long. It was actually a massive uh, um, organization uh, effort on our part. There were two of us from the ROM. We had to get this together on very short notice. We had three days to get a crew out to Prince Edward Island and, and, and all the equipment to recover one of these these um, remains. So there was myself and Oliver Hadrath from the wrong. I, I quickly reached out to our colleagues at Research Casting International and Brett Crawford and Mike Tom were technicians that came out with us and helped with the organization of all the equipment and machinery. Much of the heavy lifting, uh, whale necropsies are immense tasks. They involve dozens of scientists and veterinarians and collaborative efforts uh, with several countries uh, on, 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 on scene. And um, we had a very short window of time to recover one of these whales. They'd already started working on the necropsies the Wednesday before that holiday weekend. And um, by the time Saturday came when we arrived, uh, the, the whale that we were going to get, a big male whale, uh, number 1207 from the uh, North Atlantic right whale catalog uh, was also already had had his investigations done and had had been partially dismembered. So we really had to do just the um, heavy cleaning on the beach. That took us about, oh, four to five days to complete. Yes, I, I know one of the uh, the big differences between um, you know the blue whales that uh, we recovered from Newfoundland in 2014 um was that uh th there were no you know like full necropsies done on the blue whales um the, the dfo and i think a few other people had taken some uh like some skin samples blubber samples but but they didn't do a full necropsy so i, I think that was one of the good things because uh, there's a lot of sort of scientific scientific information that you can get from a necropsy that they did on the right whale yes. including on, on you know potentially how they might have died 
Oh, absolutely. And, and that, and that was an opportunity to have information about this whale that we otherwise would not have, have known. I mean, we, we know that we know the cause of his death. We know the injuries he sustained and, and that is novel. And yes, it's something that we didn't have the advantage of and had to sort of piece together post talk. Uh, for the, the two blue whales that we recovered back in, uh, in 2014. Um, there were some amazing things though that we were able to find out um, it, it, on the scene as we were working, uh, working with that whale. Um, okay, so, um, so maybe I guess sort of fast forward. So <laughs> you, you've got the, the skeleton and the tissue samples. Um, so now, uh, so, so what happens? Uh, how, how do you, uh, what's the process involved in getting you know, the rest of the carcass cleaned off, you know, so the bones can be put on display in exhibition. So uh, what, what are those steps like? Well, as I said, most of the heavy lifting is done on the beach um, with in conjunction with the necropsy. And that is the defleshing of all the elements, disarticulating, taking it all apart and um, and getting most of the, 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 the flesh off. And the, the, the one piece that you really can't do that well in, in the field just manually is, of course, the skull. So that was transported back uh, in one piece uh, to Research Casting International, where it was composted with the help of uh, many of our neighborhood um, cows and, and, and cattle, cattle farmers. And that uh, composting would get the rest of the flesh off and start a little bit of the degreasing. Uh, and that took about one year. Um, the degreasing process is, is added on after everything comes out of the compost. It's basically a big uh, detergent bath, a green friendly detergent. And uh, after that is done, you have a little bit of polishing and hand, uh, ref hand uh, fining of these elements before you can put them back together again. And that's when we could find some really neat things about the anatomy of this whale that I that you would not have appreciated just from the necropsy or, or just from an understanding of, of whales um, themselves. Uh, one of these things was in the case of our right whale um, that he looked to be a very mature whale. Now, everyone probably knows that you have growth plates in many of the bones in your bodies. And these growth plates called epithelial discs, they fuse at different times in your body um, according to your age. And the neat thing about uh, this right whale, every single growth plate in his body was completely fused from head to tail. There was not one element that had evidence of a growth plate that was still growing. That suggests that he was quite mature uh, an exact age. We're still trying to, to, you know, to reach out to some of our colleagues to see if we can pinpoint that down. He was, he was tracked for 37 years and he was an adult when they first began tracking him. So he's, he's probably at least uh, you know, 45, 50 years old at the time he died. So, so a mature whale, and that's actually very hopeful because uh, a lot of the North Atlantic right whales, unfortunately, are not reaching maturity, and that is compounding their, their conservation, um, conservation uh, peril at the moment. So uh, another, another interesting thing we found out about the anatomy, and if I could just get the next slide, uh, was when you finally cleaned up the skull, you could actually see where initially there wasn't a lot of evidence of damage on, on how this animal may have died. Uh, we do know from the necropsy that there was a lot of internal bleeding. There was a lot of blunt trauma injury, but there weren't any really real broken bones except one of the ear bones on the right side of the skull. However, when we were able to clean the skull, we could find at the base of the skull and very close to where those injuries occurred, there was evidence that there were some other fractured bones, probably as a result of the, you know, the impact stress sort of buffering through the rest of the skull. And that was something we would not have known. And it correlates quite well with how much, how much bleeding uh, from his neck and from, from the back of his head that this whale seemed to have indications of in the necropsy. Uh, and then one of the coolest things though I found, I can get the next uh, image up, is people may be familiar with, with whales that they have remnants of the hind legs that have been lost through evolution, through the course of evolution over millions of years. And most whale species will have at least a little bit of the hip bone left. Well, this on the ground, what you see there is the hip bones that the veterinarian, one of them, 
was able to recover for us. And I'm looking at it on the beach and I thought, what are these weird attachments to it? And uh, one of the rare things that you will find on occasion is some whale species, and within those species, a very few whales will keep the remnants of the actual hind limb and not the hips. And actually, when we took these bones back to the lab at the ROM and got to clean, clean them up with our secret dermestid colony, a bunch of beetles that love to eat flesh, and polish them up, we saw here not just the two, the long bones, there are the two left and right um, remnants of the hips or what's left of them, but in, in between them are the two femurs, the remnants of the two femurs, the top part of your leg. And down in the lower left-hand corner, two smaller remnants that likely correspond to the evolutionary remains of the fibula and tibia on one side uh, or one leg of, of the whale. And that's a really fascinating finding. I was not expecting to, to recover that. And that is something that uh, still excites me to this day. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff. And I remember um, sort of uh, getting photos that you're sending uh, me and, and the rest of our team. Uh, so I, I think one of the um, one of the few good things uh, that sort of came out of the pandemic was that um, uh, Jackie actually lives fairly close to uh, where IC, uh, RCI has her operations. So, uh, mm -hmm. so she was basically able to get uh, within uh, RCI's bubble, uh, you know, following their, you know, COVID safety protocols and everything. Uh, so it was, uh, it was actually good that we actually had, you know, um, like a ROM person on site, you know, uh, checking up on things and uh, if there's any questions uh, that came up. Um, yeah, so, uh, so us that were still, you know, stuck in Tron or, or at the museum, uh, we were sort of getting feedback, you know, from you know, as slowly the um, the uh, the right whale uh, skeleton got cleaned off uh, for display. Um, so, so Jackie, this is uh, well, both your and yours and my uh, second whale exhibition. So, uh, yeah, so the blue whale exhibition was in 2017, uh, but now we have this new exhibition coming up uh, this year, 2021. Uh, so, so what are uh, so what what's your sort of experience, or uh, what are some of the differences the, um, that you've sort of noticed between the first exhibition and, and this uh, second one? Uh, well, one of them, well, certainly the breadth. Um, here in this exhibition, we're covering uh, great whales, the largest whales uh, that occur in in well the North Atlantic waters, but elsewhere around the world. And they're quite iconic and there are a number of species. And so that's very, very exciting to bring all of this information and, and present it in such a way that people can com compare and contrast and, and grow their understanding about what uh, how ecology differs among organisms and animals. And, uh, and just about the diversity of life in our oceans. Also, this exhibition has, the first exhibition had a sense of urgency in, with respect to the blue whale is also, the North Atlantic blue whale population is very small and the blue whale is also an endangered species. But there is a heightened energy because this exhibition corresponds to the timing of this um, really critical period of time for the North Atlantic right whale in deciding whether or not it's going to be able to survive. And that energy is something that comes out in the exhibition. And we, we were really hoping in this exhibition to engage a much stronger conservation message to have people understand and, 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 and learn how they can connect with the issue. And, uh, and this involved many, many um, perspectives, uh, including reaching out to uh, our Indigenous colleagues and, and other scientists elsewhere from our typical ROM bubble to get a more holistic picture and present that holistic picture to the public. So for me, that was very exciting. Yeah, so um, I know people uh, that saw the first blue whale exhibition, so that, that's uh, my background uh, image, I think you can all see. So that's the blue whale. Um, but uh, the new uh, exhibition will have the blue whale positioned in another part of the exhibition space. Uh, yeah, so, so we, we've actually, uh, so we are using some, you know, elements such as the blue whale uh, from the first show, but, um, uh, but uh, I, I think people will be, um, will be pretty happy with it. It'll be a whole new uh, exhibition and, uh, and as Jackie said, we'll be talking 
you know, about, you know, more whales in general uh, and concentrate, you know, more on conservation issues uh, such as with the, um, uh, with the North Atlantic uh, right whale. Um, so Jackie, with the exhibition, uh, so, what, 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 um, so what main message um, uh, do you hope visitors, visitors to the ROM exhibition will take home with them? Well, the same message I get from the exhibition, and that is whales are magnificent, but they, they're not only iconic and awe-inspiring, they're also very vulnerable. And a lot of people don't appreciate that when they look at their immensity and their size. Living within or near the sphere of human activity, we impact the survival of many species. And there's certainly, as I said, an urgency in the air, particularly with the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale, which without action now may disappear entirely within our lifetime. But there's hope and in engaging with industry, scientists, indigenous and popular leadership, uh, we, can, we can change a path forward and learn to live with and not against these, uh, these great denizens of our oceans. And every single person can make a difference. It doesn't matter if you're in Toronto, if you're on the coast, if you're a scientist, a, a, you know, if you're in, in grade school, everyone can make a difference. Everyone can have an action that they can engage in. And um, I really hope the exhibition energizes people towards that end. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, think, I think that's one of the, the great things is that um, we've got mm -hmm. a lot of, um, uh, I guess, uh, collaborators, uh, people, researchers, uh, organizations um, that are helping us, uh, you know, put this exhibition together. Um, yeah, so I, I'm uh, really looking forward, to, uh, looking forward to it myself. Uh, okay, so I think we're getting uh, close to uh, the end of our presentation, so I, I want to make sure that we have time for questions, as I'm sure there will be a lot of questions <laughs> that will be asked. Um, so uh, thanks, Jackie, for joining us uh, on the program. And we My hope pleasure. It was great talking to you, Burton, again virtually. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, we and we hope that our virtual attendees will be able to visit uh, this ROM original Great Whales exhibition in person uh, in the near future. Uh, so Jackie and I will be answering some of your questions for the next few minutes. Uh, so just as a reminder, uh, questions can be submitted via the Q&A feature uh, on your Zoom screen. Okay, so the first question at the top of my uh, list is, uh, how do you get the flesh off? You sort of touched upon it um, uh, very briefly, but uh, maybe you can give a little bit more detail on how, how, how to deflush or clean off the bones. Sure, sure. So as I said, a lot of my background has been very small mammals and organisms. And at the ROM, we have this secret room full of dermestid beetles. It's actually like a bank vault hidden away. And the beetles actually do on small specimens, they do all the work for us. We actually do very little at all, except wash it off and brush it up in the end. Unfortunately, a whale is far too large, even in individual bones to fit in that room. So other tactics have to, have to be employed to do that. And uh, one of our common go-to tactic, to, as I mentioned, is composting. That's basically using a lot of poop from a lot of farm animals and burying your bones and carefully monitoring them through that process. So composting creates a lot of heat and a lot of other chemistry, and you got to make sure it's not damaging your bones. So there's a lot of monitoring that goes on almost at a daily um, daily basis out, out at RCI and more delicate bones like the hip bones as I, I, I showed you, uh, we would bring back to the ROM and prepare by hand and do that a little more carefully because we don't want to have, you know, risk losing those really rare objects that uh, are so important to our collections and to messaging. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so RCI uh, did uh, also did our blue whale and also the sperm whale, which, which also be on display. Uh, okay, so the next question we have is, uh, what sort of policy changes have you made since 2017 that have helped conservation efforts for white, white whales and or other types of whales in Canadian waters? Oh, wow, that's a great question. And there's a lot happening even as we speak. Uh, one of the first changes actually predated this event and occurred way back in the um, early 20, 2010, uh, 2015, uh, where it was wrecking. So the two leading threats to right whales have to do with the fact that they're urban whales. They live in an urban um, coastal environment and in doing so, in feeding and courting and having their babies, they interact with all our coastal activity. And the biggest threats are entanglements from, from gear, 
of, of varying sorts from, from fisheries and, and ghost gear, stuff that just floats around in the ocean, to uh, vessel strikes. So one of the first things that has been implemented um, in, in, uh, back in more of our American waters uh, has been speed reductions, and they've been very, very successful. And also lane changes in some of our, our major shipping lanes. Um, and that's that's been a critical path forward. Currently in the Canadian uh, recovery plan, we're looking at a number of things. And these things are, again, speed limits, um, acoustic monitoring, knowing where the whales are, being able to grid, create a grid of our waterways such that when we know where a whale is, we don't have to like close off the entire coastline. We can close off where the whales are, reduce speeds, um, limit activities that are occurring in those areas and, and also alter seasons. Unfortunately, this does have a huge impact on industry. So it all has to be done in consultation and collaboration. You know, it's a win-win situation if everyone uh, can, can continue on with their livelihoods and yet we don't endanger the whales uh, and, and we reduce the threats that they're encountering. And um, COVID again has been, a, has been a benefit in this. There's been um, a lot quiet, uh, the waters are a lot quieter. So acoustic monitoring is a lot better quality. Uh, and um, you know, there's a lot more travel back and forth in the waters. It's not just uh, you know, um, mercantile vessels that are a problem. It's even, you know, it's even uh, recreational vessels that can do damage uh, without even knowing it because a lot of these whales, they'll be slightly, barely hitting the surface when they're feeding. And, uh, and also when they're distracted with things like courting, they're not paying attention to what's around. So these measures are falling into place. They're constantly being um, reevaluated and revised and hopefully uh, we're carving the beginning of a path forward, but there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that um, things are, are getting better, um, but there, there's still um, uh, a lot more we can probably do. And uh, but but uh, but as you also mentioned, there there needs to be some you know compromise you know between um, you know like uh, you know the the fishing industry uh, and conservation issue. Uh, so it's it's, it's it's an ongoing thing that uh, I, I think we're headed 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 in the right direction. Okay, so uh, the next question is, uh, well, what was the cause of the death of the uh, the right whale? Oh, so our right whale, as I said, he's number 1207. If anyone's familiar with the North Atlantic right whale catalog, you can actually put in a search engine and you'll come up with it. You can access it and see pictures of whales that are, are still alive, of the monitoring efforts of, of, uh, the, of the whales, and pretty much every North Atlantic right whale that has been followed in, in, the, um, you know, in, in the research program has an identity there, whether it's a number or whether it's a name. So he, he is 1207, and the necropsy reports basically found several things. One was he had a lot of indication of blunt trauma, his chest, had uh, a lot of bruising, a lot of blood that suggested hemorrhaging. He had uh, an injury at the back of his skull that suggested he may have had a dislocation there uh, of his neck. And that also there was a fracture in the same area on the uh, right side of the tympanic bulla and the peri periodic tympanic bone, which is right about here. And it's an important, it's a very fragile area for the whales, but certainly it's obviously important for their hearing. And there's a lot of vascularity, a lot of blood vessels in that area. So he, he died of blunt trauma and it, it um, basically, it is, it's unlikely it could be anything else other than a, uh, a vessel strike that could have caused that amount of blunt trauma. Okay, so we have a question uh, beyond cleaning the bones. Do you have uh, do you have to do anything else uh, to them to preserve them long term? Oh yes, yes. So whales, as you know, the history of the commercial whaling industry was all about blubber and rendering oil. Um, that was a that was one of the big uh, focuses of that industry. Uh, but it's not just the blubber that has oil. The bones themselves are very porous. Um, there's, there's very, very thin cortical or the hard part of your bone. There's a lot of more spongy cancellar bone. So it holds a lot of fluid, it holds a lot of oil. So the bones themselves uh, are greasy and you have to get rid of a lot of that grease 
um, or else ultimately you're dealing with things like mold or, or worse, you're dealing with little critters that like the oil just as much as they like uh, nibbling on, on other dead parts of an animal and uh, you could end up with an infestation in your collections, which we don't want. So degreasing usually takes almost, well, it takes months to do to properly degrease. And then you have to continue to monitor uh, those bones to make sure that, that that doesn't, the problem doesn't reoccur, that you've got everything out. Uh, then you might need to, um, usually it's not, the, the smell isn't, after that, the smell is pretty much gone. But once in a while, you may have to deodorize a little bit too, just to get rid of uh, any remnants of smell that people might find uh, um, not to their liking as they go through an exhibition. After that, it's the storage conditions for the bones and then the, the mounting of the remains, uh, which again, uh, we leave to our expert colleagues at Research Casting International as behind Burton, you can see, did a wonderful job with their blue whale and are doing a wonderful job with the whales that you're going to see in the current exhibition. So uh, visitors don't have to worry about uh, whale oil grease dripping on them, right? Uh, nor smell. <laughs> nor smell, excellent. <laughs> okay, um, uh, I, I always love this question. I don't, it doesn't matter how many times I hear it, but uh, what is the significance of the right part of the name? How was it named? Oh, that's, I love that question. Um, so there are, there are a couple layers to that question. So the first layer is um, commercial whaling, industrial whaling. Um, this, this actually, the, the focus of the right whale and the bowhead whales, once upon a time, it was thought they all looked very similar, big, fat, slow whales with a lot of blubber, and that was the target of the early whaling industry, all the way back to the Basques, and, and perhaps even earlier, um, there's some evidence of even uh, Scandinavian whaling that were looking for the same things, big, fat, slow whales that were the right whale to pursue because they were slow, they were very fat, had a lot of resources, and partly because of that, they didn't sink immediately when they died. So you could not only go out and get your whale, uh, you could keep your whale until you could get it to shore. Because in the early days of whaling, all the rendering had to be done on shore. They couldn't, they didn't have the, you know, the technology to do it on ships. However, there's another side to that story, and. Um, uh, historical naturalists also had uh, a problem with dis distinguishing between the bowhead whale and these other whales that look like the bowhead whale, but weren't really the bowhead whale. They were slightly different. So part of the right whale also came up in the, the needing to divide this what was once thought one species into different genera, one of them being Eubalina glacialis, or Eubalina was the genera, which was the, the right whale of the ice. Eubalina, the correct whale, the true whale of the, the ice was Glacialis. And that's the one that was in the North Atlantic, right? Uh, the North Atlantic Ocean. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, okay. History so, uh, lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that the whale, the right whale, uh, has been tracked for around 35 or 37 years. Uh, I was wondering how you keep track uh, of a whale for so long, uh, is it with a tracking device or by sight? Uh, which organization keeps uh, these data? Ah, that's another great question. And lots of organizations are, are involved. The umbrella organization is the North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium. Under this organization are all the participating units um, and, and including the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, many universities such as Dalhousie, um, the Marine Animal Response Society, the Canadian Whaling Institute, the, uh, the New England Aquarium, um, uh, our counterpart in the United States, the uh, NOAA, and um, most of the most of the identification would be photo identification. So right whales develop things on their 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 bonnets, the front of their noses or their heads. Uh, called callosities. These are raised areas on around their mouth and on their heads. And on these callosities over time where there's wear and tear, you get organisms that start to move in and um, infest them. And uh, these are mostly lice, but they give a, a pattern to those callosities that become like a map on the whale. And sadly, uh, one of the other things that helps you identify are the injuries a whale has sustained that sometimes actually contributes to the names they get because scars, will bring to mind certain 
uh, ideas. Uh, one, a whale that passed um, uh, an old grandmother whale um, some decades ago was punctuation. She was named after some scars and marks on her that looked like punctuation marks, hence her name. So um, it's photo identification. It involves a lot of aerial survey on, on the water survey um, from many organizations and many contributing bodies. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing uh, all the data that they've uh, compiled, uh, a lot of useful information too. Um, okay, so uh, what did the 40 or so uh, right whales actually die of? Uh, so, so I guess this is um, over the years, I guess. Yeah, so the vast majority of whales, so of that, um, the largest subset of that died from anthropogenic causes, meaning died from things that we did and, um, and that's well over, uh, I think that's somewhere upwards of 85% of whale deaths that are known. I mean, there are lots of deaths that we don't get to know about because they're never found or they're, they're so decomposed, you can't determine the cause of death. Now of that breakdown, um, just over half are due to chronic or acute entanglements. The other amount, is due to um, injury from vessel strikes. And that can either be blunt trauma, mostly internal injuries, which can go on for some time, or it can be really devastating acute trauma. Um, and I can't, I can't impress on you devastating when you see how, the extent to which some of the sharp injury can happen to these whales. So that's pretty much it. Um, there's the odd one that dies from a, a, a normal event. Um, but that's the rarity, unfortunately, in this day, to this day, it's, uh, it's mostly coming in contact with human activities and uh, not, not having, you know, not being able to succumbing to those injuries. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing some of the photos and videos uh, as we were, you know, putting uh, together the exhibition uh, of, of whales uh, in ghost gear and stuff like that. Uh, so it, it actually uh, is, is uh, quite sad some of these images um, um, out there. Uh, what are some everyday activities which Canadians can do or not do to protect uh, whale populations? Well, one of the best ones is what you're doing right now and that's learning and becoming aware and getting energized about the problem uh, and being able to take your voice to your community, your, your friends, your family, your community and uh, and and raise action. Um, sometimes that action can be, you know, um, making decisions about what you're doing in your own sphere that impacts on, on whales ultimately. Um, but also larger things like, it, it, those are the things that are killing whales now, our Northern Light Right whales now. There are things that in the long term, even if they survive, we need to consider for their, their future. And some of these things are like the conditions of their, of their oceans that they live in. And that affects the quality of their food, the quality of the habitats that they raise their young. So some of the things, even as simple as thinking about the way we use plastic. Plastic is a huge problem in marine environments right now. It impacts many whale species. It's becoming in, increasingly evident that it's contributing to, to whale mortalities. And, and that's something we can all look at, You know, just how do we make our day-to-day um, economic decisions and purchasing decisions and saying, you know, is there an alternative that we can think about? Um, thinking forward too to climate change and all of the impact that is having. The oceans are one of the, the um, first place, that's one of the strongest evidence that we have that there is actually something bad going on. Ocean waters are raising in temperature. Um, there, there are water bodies in the north that are no longer covered with ice that would normally be covered with polar ice. This is changing habitat. And so again, all the things that we can do to contribute to um, an outcome with these regards, one voice is one voice, but collectively we are many voices. And just like one action, it's the same thing. The more of us that do the old adage, act locally, think globally, applies here very well. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot uh, that uh, people can do to, um, to help whales and just conservation in general. Uh, so this question is um, related to uh, the significant losses of these mass mortality events with the um, with the right right whales. Um, um, so what about uh, what what are their birth rates uh, like? 
Yeah, well, that's been a problem too. So there is another, as I said, these are acute issues that are, are a threat now, but there are threats going forward. And one of the problems we're seeing, and it relates to many factors, is the condition, overall condition of whales. Now, of that population of whales, less than 75 are adult females, breeding females that are of reproductive potential that can contribute to you know, the increasing numbers of whales. So not that many females and they're not having many calves. Uh, calving rate has dropped in the last decade. This year has been a bit of a success story. We've had, I believe there were between 19, 19 upwards of 19 calves. It may have actually been 21, 19 I think that are still alive. Uh, and that's, that's a big improvement over previous years. But even so, over the last few years, um, mortalities exceed births by three to two. So that's still you know, not, not good enough. Uh, so we have to look at what's affecting the condition of females. Why is it they're not having calves? Um, what, what, what can we do to, you know, to help um, mitigate that? Some of it's the burden of chronic entanglement. You, can, you don't necessarily die immediately up from an entanglement. You might have some minor entanglement that over time accumulates, but carrying gear, carrying that weight, not being able to have full range of motion will affect how you, you eat and how you, how you move. And not to mention that it's going to stress, give you stress and affect your physiology that way. And these things can all contribute to um, the calving rates that, that we're seeing. But as I said, this year was a hopeful year, um, crossing fingers that that carries on forward. And uh, it is a sign, it is a sign of something we can grab on that says, you know, things are maybe going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, I think this might be our last question here. Um, uh, how different are North Atlantic right whales compared to North Pacific uh, and Southern right whales? Uh, are they all critically endangered? No, they're not all critically endangered. And that's an interesting question. Um, so the um, North Pacific is also an extremely rare um, species. There aren't that many left. They had um, a similar tremendous, most the initial impact on the right whale populations and the bowhead populations was uh, industrial whaling and, and commercialized whaling that, that just you know, decimated those numbers. Of the three species that, that there are in the genus Eubelina, there's the North Atlantic, the North Pacific, as you mentioned, uh, and the Southern right whale. The Southern right whale is actually doing remarkably well. It's made a tremendous recovery of population size. Uh, and it's, it um, certainly is the focus of, of um, uh, tremendous interest in, in tourism, ecotourism, and so forth. So it's it's actually doing fairly well and birth rates are, are much better than they are in the North Atlantic. The other thing I'd say about the differences of them, uh, over as I, as I mentioned, overall condition. Uh, the North Atlantic right whale is not carrying as much weight in general than some of the you know, images we have from some of the other species. And that could be due to things like chronic stress, chronic entanglement, um, but they are three separate species. And that also means they have subtle differences in their appearance and their morphology and their behavior as well. Right. Uh, okay, so it looks like we, uh, that was not the last question. I don't think, oh, I, th I think we might have one more here. Um, with only around 400 right whales remaining uh, and the low number of females in the population, uh, is this species entering an extinction vortex? Well, that certainly is, is a risk and, and a very imminent risk if we don't act. But you know, I'd like to quote uh, a scientist from the Canadian Wildlife, uh, the Canadian Whale Institute, uh, Dr. Moira Brown. And she remarked to me in my first conversation with her that one thing about the North Atlantic right whale is they're resilient. You know, the Basque whaling and commercial whaling decimated their numbers to, to a remnant of original population size. And in some places, they were totally removed from areas that they were traditionally associated with. Yet they're still here. They still have numbers. They're still breeding. They're still producing young. It has not happened in that long period of time with the, you know, with the history of commercial whaling 
and also since the uh, moratorium on, on commercial whaling that affects the North Atlantic right whale. So there is hope. And so even though the numbers are very low, if, if we do act in the right ways and engage in the right ways, and you know, and this, this, like I said, it's a collaborative effort. You can't just say any one thing is to blame or all to blame. Everyone that purchases something in a store to some degree is to blame. So we, we have a responsibility and that responsibility extends to stewardship. So if we, if we act now, even with those numbers, there are projections where they can recover and not go extinct. I mean, the decision we have to make is, do we have the will to do this? Yes, okay. Um, I, I, I wish we had like another hour um, because uh, I know there's probably a lot of other questions um, uh, that got out there, uh, either from the Q and A or from the chat. Um, yeah, they've been great questions. But, uh, oh yeah, but, uh, but I think sadly our time is up. Uh, so thank you, Jackie, and thank you uh, all for joining us virtually. Um, we hope to see you again uh, for our next uh, Curator of Conversations on June 3rd. Uh, details of all upcoming ROM at Home online programs can be found on the ROM website and our social media channels. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>